unmute. <laughs> Hi. Hey, uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone uh, watching uh, now or later to the Tabletop Express. Uh, we have an awesome Creators Corner today. I have David Thompson with me. Hi, David. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. I mean, this is great. Uh, so uh, just so you know, Creators Corner, uh, this is a, a segment that we do on the show where we talk to creators of board games, either people that are either designers, uh, publishers, really anyone that's just within this hobby that we love. And today we are going to talk to you, David Thompson, designer, about board games. Uh, and yeah, um, so... As it is a live Q&A, so if anyone comes on and has any questions, they feel free to can ask them. But I do want to ask, uh, there's there's always a question we start off with for everyone. Um, why don't you give everyone uh, your, your board game origin story? What brought you into this hobby? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so board games specifically is not something I, was, I got into until probably about 10 years ago. Um, I got into board games sort of through, well, through uh, role-playing games. So I grew up as a as an RPGer, mostly playing d and I mean, played played a little bit of other stuff, but really it was mostly d and um, Started when I was, you know, probably like seriously playing around 12, 13. Played through high school into college into the time I joined the Air Force. Um, pretty much stuck with it. Usually pretty heavily involved, usually as a dungeon master, so no, doing a lot of um, creative kind of sort of content creation then, even just for the you know the local groups as you do with a DM, as a DM. Um, but about the time I, I was um, getting married and having kids and settling down and stuff, I, I was spending a ton of time as, you know, prepping for sessions as a DM, because I was always like the guy that had to have homebrew everything. Yeah. And so I was thinking, man, this is a lot of um, time investment. I wonder if, you know, there's a different, hobby or something I should check out. And uh, I was listening to the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, which is a you know, popular podcast. Yeah. When they first started out, I was listening to them and they had RPG content in their main uh, podcast, which they really don't need more. But um, I was listening to, to them for their RPG content and they were talking about board games. And I only sort of vaguely knew about board games through you know walking into game stores or something. I would, I would see board games. So I didn't really paying attention. And so that's what brought me uh, into the board game hobby. I, I got into it through, through that podcast. And then I, um, yeah, I, you know, I thought I, I dig like Ameritrash games. That's what I yeah. thought I would be drawn to. And, and it, that's what I kind of started with. And it didn't take me long to sort of discover, you know, euros and then really my true love, which is sort of the war game Euro hybrid, right. That's our historical game, you know, Euro hybrid. So, um, Honestly, it wasn't long after I got into playing board games that I started, you know, really trying to to get into design too. Yeah, and so in particular, like, uh, what games what games called out to you in like the beginning? Like, what was the first hobby board game you played? What was the one yeah. that really pulled you in? Yeah, I mean, it's a so I was it was a couple of things happening sort of simultaneously, right? Like, so, so I mentioned that I kind of got into it through Seeker Cabal, and so mm -hmm. I I can't remember exactly, but it was something like. I listened to the podcast and I went to Board Game Geek and I somehow stumbled upon a group. And I was at the time I was living in Huntsville, Alabama. And so I kind of stumbled into a group. And so I was kind of just playing whatever they were going to play. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember, you know, those first couple of sessions. The only thing that really sticks out is Star Wars um, X-Wing had, had just recently oh, yeah. come out, right? Which was a great, like, you know, it's a lot of, it's a little bit of everything, right? It's Ameritrashy, but it's got models and it's board game and it's this yeah. everything. So it was a really good, you know, first, first impression for me. Um, but at the same time, my wife and I, like I would pick up things like Carcassonne, right? Mm -hmm. Like very first, you know, like almost like tropey first, you know, board game. Yeah. Um, and, and we would play a little bit with like our neighbors and stuff. So like while we were doing like Seven Wonders and Carcassonne, I was also going to like a gamer group to play, you know, um, you know, we'll talk about it in more detail later, but yeah. you know, um, a few acres of snow, right. Is where that's yeah. where I was introduced to it. So, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about it now. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny because, you know, when people, when people, so the, one of the games I'm best known for is undaunted. Right. Um, right. And so, and then, and then war chest. Right. And we, in, in, there's a whole conversation to be had about the DNA that the two of those share, but, um, really 
the lineage or, or the inspiration of Undaunted can be traced back to a few acres of snow. And maybe I didn't know about it for, you know, for a few years, but it's one of the first deck builders I played, which is very unusual, right? When somebody says yeah. their first deck builders, usually Dominion or Ascension. For me, it was the, the two I distinctly remember were Arctic Scavengers, which is, oh, a, is a great, yeah. you know, thematic deck builder and few acres of snow. And the thing that few acres of snow did very early on, you know, I think maybe one of the first, maybe along with trains, was this idea of integrating a board into deck build or deck building into a board or however you want to say it. And almost certainly it was the first, like, let's combine deck building with this concept of whatever you want to call it, area control, the sort of war gamey type, you know, concept. Yeah. Um, and so throughout my, you know, whatever it's been six, seven years of, of game design, it's always been something that's, that's um, influenced me. Right. Like the, just the, the combination of those two different worlds and that game specifically. Yeah. I mean, so I know you best uh, through undaunted. I played a lot of undaunted um, and uh, with, with, with that in particular, like, like I could see, I mean, a few acres of snow, you said it kind of led up to that system with war chest and with, undaunted was the was that like your look is that like your first board game design that you were really pushing yeah. towards it yeah. Was, yeah so yeah so when um yeah and when i say let's like you know i don't think i don't think i don't think people would necessarily draw a, a line between the two right yeah. like but it, for sure the inspiration um it, it's an interesting like what was my first design is a very kind of convoluted story so yeah um you know way before i was starting to get into board games um, I had, I grew up, I said, I grew up on RPGs and that's true, but I also grew up playing like tactical role-playing video, or, like video games. Right. So, okay. um, we're talking like first gen PlayStation era. So like final fantasy tactics and ogre battle and ogre tactics. If people know those games, those were the ones that were influencing me. Yeah. And, and I did have a couple of friends who, when I was playing D and D, um, introduced me to games like blood bowl okay. and, I played, I don't know if you know that are familiar with this or not, but I played a game, Mage Knight, way yeah. before the board game, the Clicks oh, game. Oh, yeah, okay. the click, the original Clicks one. The original yeah. Clicks one, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when you look at things that I sort of like, my formative gaming experiences, D&D, the Clicks games, uh, Blood Bowl, these these um, tactical um, you know, RP, video game RPGs, that's, those were my influences. And so well before I got into the whole board game hobby, I was actually working on a design that in our times now we would think of as just another mashup skirmish minis board game, right? Mm -hmm. There's a million there. There's like probably 16 on Kickstarter right now, I'm sure. Um, but at the time there was really nothing like that. And I would try to find games. I would try to research games that were similar to kind of research. Cause I didn't have know anything about design or game production or anything. Yeah. And so as I'm trying to design this, you know, tactical mini skirmish board game hybrid thing, um, I was tr just trying to find any other games like it. And so that was my first design. And ultimately that design would morph over the years and eventually be published as a game called For What Remains. Um, oh, it, yeah. That's from um, Dan Verson Games, who's the publisher for my Solitaire War games. And so um, that was interesting because it was, you know, it still harkens back to those early years of its design, but I didn't publish it until 2020 and so it didn't get published until 2020. And so yeah. what that allowed me to do is it actually yeah. has a lot of um, that here. But, yeah. Yeah. And so this, it, it gave me the opportunity to actually take a lot of modern war game uh, mechanical concepts and sort of integrate them into the design, which made it, you know, much, much better than what I originally had. So it's fortuitous that it took me literally 15 years to get it from concept to, to publication, because I think the design is, is much better for it in the long run. Yeah. That's um, wild. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the first one. Now, like the first one after I started actually playing games, there were a few games that were all like sort of the concepts were all happening at the same time um, yeah. after I started gaming. And it was, it was the game that would eventually become undaunted. It was the uh, switch and signal. Um, and, um, Oh, what's the, I'm blanking on the other one. Armageddon? Oh, is, no, it was before Armageddon. So this is, this is the, the interesting thing oh. about, about publication cycles, right? Is your, your yeah. design sometimes get published way after the, you know, other right. ones. I'll, it'll come to me later, but it was, it was undaunted. Well, it was for what remains, I guess. Right. 
And so yeah. the reason that those stand out is um, I started getting into gaming. I moved to the UK, started um, working with a design and playtest uh, group there in Cambridge. And I went to Spiel in 2014 and I took Undaunted and Switch and Signal and For What Remains. I took all of those games with me. So they would eventually become published, but nice. all of those were sort of, you know, percolating at the same time. So, um, yeah, it's very strange, right? So that was 2014, but my first game wouldn't be published until 2016, and that was Armageddon. Right. And so, was... yeah, it's, it's, it's just the, 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 you know, the fickle nature of, of board game publishing timelines. No, I it's, get it's it. Crazy. I have Armageddon right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and that's, you know, I, I find it really cool. Like, that's so funny that li literally the first game that you just mentioned was a game that came out in 2020, you know? Right. Uh, but this, I think this is marked on Board Game Geek as your first released published game, published game, right? It, it is. It's the first published game. So basically what happened is, you know, I mentioned I, I moved to the UK yeah. uh, in June 2014. By September, I was at Spiel. So it was like a lightning in, in, in red. At the time, it didn't feel this way. But in retrospect, it was like this lightning fast thing between falling in with that design group and, and getting ready for Spiel and pitching games. Um, so what happened was, you know, I went to Spiel and I pitched the game that would become Undaunted to a few publishers. Osprey, who was the eventual publisher, was interested, but it, it's a, a very, very long side story. Yeah. Um, Switch and Signal didn't originally get... It, it got a little bit of interest that we want to go with a couple of publishers, etc. But when I came back from that spiel, uh, one of the members of the design group there in Cambridge, his name is Chris Marling, um, he and I started working more and more together. And he had the original concept of what would eventually become Ar Armageddon. And he just asked me if I wanted to collaborate with him on it. And so um, it was a fantastic experience for me because he had already had a game published called, um, um, oh, God, I'm, I'm this Don't is, worry. This is horrible. I, I have the answers in front of me. <laughs> yes, yes. Look up, Chris's, look up Chris's published games. I'll look um, at his published games here. Empire Engine. Empire yes. Engine, okay. Oh, oh I man. found it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would have been embarrassing. So, um, <laughs> okay. so he had already, you know, he'd already yeah, gone through the publication the process, and yeah. which is a great game. And he, um, it was just awesome. It was a great experience for me because it basically was an easy way for me to like fall in with a person who could mentor me. He had right. kind of already been there and done that. He knew a lot about the gaming industry, and so it was a it was a crazy experience. Uh, and it was really one of those negative lessons learned because what happened was. We worked on Armageddon. We took it to Spiel 2015, and it was our very first pitch session. And Chris wasn't even there. We had to split up, and we were doing our own sort of schedule mm. um, to try to maximize our time. And it was, if I remember right, it was the very first session of the very first day. And I took it to Queen, and I pitched it to them, and they were super interested. And they asked if they could keep it, and we're like, no, we have a lot of other meetings. And they were, and they they signed it on the spot, which is kind of unheard of, right? Like yeah. you don't typically have that happen. And so um, and I, I say it's a negative lesson learned because it's since never happened and I expect it never to happen again, right? Like <laughs> just take a game in and a publisher signs it immediately. And, yeah. And so by the next spiel, it was out, right? So it was one year from from them signing it to them getting it at, the, you know, releasing it the, the following spiel, which is lightning fast. So that, that is lightning yeah. fast. I yeah, And so you had it like ready to go, like you brought the prototype version to them mm -hmm. with the intention yeah. of finding a publisher that would, Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what, I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of two sides to, to, to Essen, right? There's the side of the, it's a, it's a convention for people to come and buy games. You don't right. really play games there. You come in and buy games and on the, the sort of like the, the other half of it or whatever, the other part of it that most people don't interact with is all the sort of meetings going on. And it's not just, it's not just designers pub pitching to publishers, it's publishers meeting and talking about localization deals and you know, all that sort of stuff is happening there. And so for me, going to Essen, um, I'm not a huge game buyer, right? Like I have a, you know 100, 150 games. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not a cult of the new kind of guy. Yeah. And so uh, I would never go to Spiel just to buy games, right? For me, it was strictly to go there to pitch. And so you look at your schedule, and it's just like from open to close. You know, who, which publishers you meeting, which to pitch, which games, and yeah, that's awesome. I yeah. mean, uh, so I, I you know. Armageddon, I've looked up, but I don't. I, I can you give me a quick elevator pitch of this game because uh -huh. I've I've always wanted to to pick this one up and try it out. Yeah, so Armageddon is is an interesting beast because thematically it is 
you building up your town in a post-apocalyptic world, right? Mm -hmm. Building your town. There's a there's a subtitle for it called From the Ground Up, which was the original title for it. It was going to okay. be called From the Ground Up. And, and the idea is you're building your your town from the ground up. Um, it's a it's a very so the theme is, you know, post-apocalyptic world, building a town, surviving against marauders. Mechanistically, it is a very Euro, right? So it has the yeah. central auction mechanic and you're you're essentially bidding with your workers, your people of the town yeah. to do all sorts of things, right? You're bidding them to get, um, you know, loot. You're bid keeping them back at the town to defend. So um, it's a really, I mean, at the heart of it, and most of, most of the original uh, auction concept was Chris's idea. So I can, I can talk about how good it is because I'm talking about Chris's oh, good nice. idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an <laughs> awesome, you know, central auction mechanism that's used in, I think, a, a unique way. Yeah. And so if you like euros and you like, you know, thematic euros, I think, I think it's a good, you know, it's a good game. Sure. Um, so after Armageddon, uh, is released, uh, mm -hmm. and you're working with Chris, what other, what, what, what game came next for, for you? Like what was next on your game design yeah. journey? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think, I think the next release was War Chest. Yeah, I don't. I may be missing I mean, something there. We'll, we'll run with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no I will say this. So what happened basically is, yeah. Oh, no, I think Orc Olympics was the next game that came out, okay. which is a small little like. Um, it, it, it's another interesting story. And so that the important thing about Orc Olympics is not Orc Olympics itself, which is you know that, yeah. that's a funny thing to say. Orc Olympics is the first game that Trevor Benjamin and I designed together. Oh, really? And, you know, and so Trevor and I are basically, you know, we, again, right he's, he's another, you know, non non Brit that was part of the Cambridge group. He's Canadian, so we were right. both there in Cambridge together, and we just started working together, and we really clicked. Um, I mean, he's one of my best friends in the world now. Independent of game design, we, you know, it's we I've, talk. I've seen you refer to him as your brother from another mother. That's it. He is. So. He really is. He really <laughs> is. You know, and I'm not. I'm not the best person in the world at, at keeping in contact with people, right? Like I'm a very introvert with that, that cliche, like tight group of, you know, small number of friends that I care yeah. passionately about. And he's one of them. So, um, but this was the first game that we worked on together that was published, right? Again, because we were working on Undaunted before this, but, but um, it came out and it's the funny story about it is I went to Trevor and I, what I wanted to do was this really sort of like small footprint, um, fantasy football game like about like like actual football american okay. football sure and you were going to be like playing seasons and it was going to be it was really going to be about the meta game between seasons about building your team up and stuff like that and um over time it just kind of morphed into this more sort of family friendly lighter thing that became work olympics which is you know it's a fun game we play with the kids and stuff but what the interesting thing about both armageddon and work olympics is that uh i would define that as my part the part of my design time where I was trying to figure out what kind of games I wanted to design. Right. Yeah. And so if you look at the kind of stuff that comes after it, it those two stand out as being very different, right. Yeah. A very Euro sort of this auction driven, which I've never done anything else like Armageddon and or Olympics, which is just, you know, sort of a light drafting um, game. So they just, they're, they're, I like them both. You know, I love all my children equally, but they're very, are very different than sort of what's come afterwards. Yeah, no, totally. And yeah. you, you know, one thing uh, you're, you, you're, you're, what, what I always uh, found interesting about your designs too, I see you collaborating a lot too, and mm. that makes me think that you're, you know, you've got like this team player kind of niche thing going on. Yeah, I, I definitely. So there's a lot of reason to collaborate. Um, yeah, I used to say that I would work on solitaire war games by myself because there's, you know, there's solitaire games that I can test by myself and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And everything else I would do is collaborations. Um, and we'll talk about that. Well, that's not true in a second. And I'll come back and yeah. remind me about the war game thing, but I will. the thing about the design collaborations is um, I mean, there's just so many, there's so many reasons to do it. And there's, I can't think of many reasons not to, unless you just aren't good at working with other people, which is a legitimate thing, right? If you, if you, you know, you can't. Yeah. Um, and because, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things to do and you can't be good at everything very, unless you're like a Reiner Knizzi, a savant, right? Like you can't right. be good at everything. So um, the, the one thing about designing with a partner though, is that like, you do have to have a period where you're learning each other. Right. So, so Jeff Engelstein and I are working on a game together right now. And it was interesting because this, we had, we had only met once briefly in person and we had only communicated, you know, a little bit online. 
And yeah. so uh, designing a game with somebody, you, you get to know them, right? Like their idiosyncrasies and their personality and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not every part design partnership is not going to be perfect. You have to kind of learn the person and stuff, but um, there's just so many reasons to do it. And so, like I said, I used to think that I would just do a lot of collaborations on my non-solo war game stuff, but, but even those, you know, the first couple Castle Litter and, and um, Pavlov's House and stuff, I'm listed as the only designer. Um, but everything after that, I've had somebody else to collaborate with. Now, usually that means it's a historical expert that I'm collaborating with. Oh, okay. And so what I what I think is fair to do to them is list them as, I, I don't call them, you know, it's, it's co-creator, right? So there's a huge part that they're playing in the research and the making sure that the game, you know, accurately reflects the situation. And when you're designing a historical game and you want the history to play an important part, like having that person as a co-creator is important. Um, in that, and that even goes to the latest game, solo war game that I worked on, uh, Lands Earth Ridge. The yeah. co-creator on that is is the artist Neil Johansson because because the design of the board was such a collaborative effort and, and all elements, all the art elements. He's responsible for everything, yeah. especially the board. Like it tells the battlefield tells such an important story in the game um, that it was a collaboration, right? We, we were co-creators. And so putting yeah. the game on the box was important to me as a, as a co-creator. Um, so yeah, I just, I've kind of just, I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not designing games for money, right? Like it's, it's purely a, a passion thing. And so I'm the most passionate part of it for me is the people. And that's the, the best part. And so, um, I just want to work with people when I'm doing when I'm doing something I love, you know. That's awesome. And this was this was recently on Kickstarter mm -hmm. too. Yeah, like yeah. Earlier think, this year. Uh, yeah, earlier this year it was on Kickstarter. Yeah, hopefully yeah. it'll. It's at the printers now, so hopefully you know we'll be. Who, who knows? At the printers now could mean it's going to be seven <laughs> years. But yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but you know, everything is everything that we can do. Myself and the publisher can do has been done, and so it's just yeah. like the printer gods now, whatever they decide. So that's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, I and you know, uh, going back to. I'm glad you brought up the history portion of it because I was wondering because I've seen a lot of your, especially the war game designs. They always have there's there's some games that have such unique stories. You know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of uh, of soldiers and postman postman's uniforms and and you know by stealth and sea. I thought yeah. was like so I, I I clamored towards this game. I, I heard about it uh, and I picked it up because it sounded like the kind of game I wanted, which is like a stealth kind of board game where you're really just riding on the on you know like you know just like you could die at any minute yeah. and i and what's fascinating is so you tell the story probably better at this because you have the the companion book with this too um so but it, it, correct me if I'm wrong it's italian frogmen that are mm -hmm. on like a it's, it's just two guys on like a little submarine yeah yeah like, yeah so yeah. so you know it's it's interesting um yeah, this is a is a, like every game has its origin story, right? And so you can go on. We can have entire entire discussions about every game. Yeah. And in this one, I mean, it's un, it's incredible. And when you tell people, like, when you tell people about the story of Castle Litter, or you tell the people the story of about by by Stealth and Sea, like people don't believe you because it sounds so ridiculous, right? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah. So what happened was the Italians wanted to destroy British shipping. There, the Italians are clearly this is World War Two. The right. Italians are clearly not a, a a match, a symmetrical match for the Brits, right? They can't just go toe to toe with them in the Mediterranean Sea, and so they have to figure out some asymmetric way to to disrupt the British shipping and British Navy, and so um, they they developed this idea. It was originally kind of born out of some World War One concepts where they would sneak into a harbor, and so in this case, they were attacking the Royal Navy in, in Gibraltar and Algiers and Alexandria. That they would sneak in with a submarine. Uh, so first of all, they had to sneak in, which this the game actually only has the scenarios where the the Italian human torpedo operators actually were able to start the mission, right? There were many yeah. missions that, like, they didn't even get that far. Like, the sub right. was caught and, like, attacked, and everybody died. And so, yeah. you know, that, that part of the game's not there. But, you know, so the sub sneaks into the into the harbor. It uh, kind of settles down. Now, there's a whole second half to it where they, they create a secret base in Gibraltar, like, in the bay. And they're like operating from a secret base, sending these guys across the bay. Like it's just it's just amazing. History is an, an unbelievable thing. But um, but the sub would get there, and they would they would let off three of these human torpedoes. So they're yeah. torpedoes that that each torpedo two guys are riding. There's three of them, so we're talking about six total guys. 
Um, there would be a backup crew just in case the crew gets sick or whatever. But once they're out, they're out. That's it. Yeah. And so they would they would ride these torpedoes. They have to ride them, you know, covertly, right, to get to the bay. Um, then they would get there. They would detach the front of the torpedo of the torpedo, which is a, a limpet mine. Would attach that to their target ship. They would try to swim to safety. And then a couple hours later, the delay would go off and it would blow up and, you know, it, whatever they would destroy, they would destroy. Most of the time, so early on, most of the time they weren't successful at all because the equipment was so horrible, right? Like their, right. One of their main early enemies was the equipment itself because it was all this prototype equipment. Um, and then later on, you know, the Brits got smart and they understood and so they developed all these defenses. And so usually the Italians just kind of had to make do with what they could attack, which usually meant like merchant ships, right? Yeah. So it wasn't this massive deal. But I mean, in the case of one attack, they actually basically knocked out two battleships. Yeah. So if you think about, I mean, it may this may be an overstatement, but I can't imagine what is in in human history this, the the difference between six men taking out two battleships. Like I don't know if there's ever, ever been right. equal, right? Like it's just incredible. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a cool game design. The the thing that I'm most proud of. I think is the way that the game, because we should say it's a solitaire game. You can play it cooperatively, yeah. but it's a solitaire. That's game. yeah. Um, so I love love the way that the game models because it's, it's seven scenarios linked together as a campaign. So you can either play them like just play the historical campaign. Yeah. Or you just play each scenario historically, or you can like play it as a custom campaign. And your guys get better and all that, or they die, right? Right. Um, but like the better you do in the campaign, the better the British responses are yeah. because that's what happened in real life, right? Like if, if, if the Italians hit a, a single merchant ship and that's all that ever happened, the Brits would kind of sort of respond. It's not a big deal. But when they started actually doing damage, the Brits were throwing all sorts of attention or resources at it. Right. Yeah. And so the cool thing for me designing the game is that happened historically. So it allows me to model it in the game in a very cool gameplay way that lets the game organically ratchet up the the difficulty and the tension and stuff. And and a game like this, is it one of those things where you've heard about the story and you wanted to translate it into a game or you have the mechanics in mind and No, uh, I no, I've never uh man, let me think if this is true. I I I don't have a single published game where I thought about the mechanics before the game. Okay. I am not a mechanics first kind of guy. Yeah. Um yeah, it's always been sort of. I mean, I guess the closest thing would be like in the Valiant Defense series. So in Castle Litter mm -hmm. and Pablo's House, they they share a lot of similar gameplay elements. So in those, you could you could say like, what? How can the Valiant Defense series support another scenario? But even then, like Lanzarote Ridge has a completely new combat system. All it's very different, right? And so it yeah. has to change to model the situation. So. Yeah, I'm very much a, you know, this is an awesome story. I can't believe this happened. How in the world could this be a game is is the process typically. And they feel that way. Honestly, like this game really felt that way for me when I played it. I mean, I'm, I think I'm three quarters in into the historic uh, campaign. I'm just like cursing my head off while I play this game. But like, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I dig that, you know, like that's, yeah. I, I know what I'm getting into. That's what I yeah. want, you know? Yeah. Let I me don't. let me do my my public service announcement for for players who might be interested. You know, people that watch this are like, oh, I've never heard of buy stealth. And so, I mean, we, we're yeah. talking niche within a niche within a niche. It's right? a this very is, niche. Yeah, is, is, you have to be a board gamer, then a war gamer, then a solitaire war gamer, and then care about something as crazy as Italian human torpedo operators. But you know, right. if this if this picks piece your interest and you're interested in the game, one yeah. thing I did do is you play through the scenarios like chronologically, right? But what that means is the first scenario is ridiculously unforgiving and hard, yep. like super <laughs> yeah. unforgiving and hard because it's that's how it was. Like yeah. they didn't, they pretty much didn't do anything, right? Like they just yeah. battled their equipment, and you'll experience that. And so I have had people come back and say, like, I I can't do anything. It's super difficult. And you know, I guess in retrospect, maybe what I should have done is told people to play a different scenario first that was a little more forgiving, right? But um, I would just say, you know. If you're if you're interested in the game, you know, play the first scenario, learn the game, and then move on, right? Well, I'm going to change the subject to a game with a, a beginning first scenario because um, you've recently talked about Undaunted Normandy. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is like you know, like probably the game you're most mm -hmm. you're, you're well known for. Yeah, um, this, and, this and Warchester by far, the right? Game too, yeah, and and with this game in particular, it is a scenario based game, mm -hmm. and I forget where you said it, but you said. Uh, you feel like uh, because there is this sense of a lot of board gamers want to go in, they want to play a game once and go out. 
a lot of the pictures you see of this game is always scenario one. Yeah. You know? Yep. yep that's right. I mean, I would say, so, um, yeah. Yeah. First of all, like the very first thing you should think about, well, the first thing you should think about when you're designing a game, this is all my, my opinion, right? Is, yeah. Is, you know, why am I designing this game? Is it for me? Is it for somebody else? Blah, 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 right? Like you should, you should think about like, why am I designing it? And then you, once you've settled on the why, you know, like who am I designing this for, right? And so by Stealth and Sea, like I'm not joking. It, basically, I was designing it for myself. Like this is really yeah. cool. This is interesting. I want to explore it. I know it's never going to sell a bunch of copies. I'm not worried about that. It doesn't have to appeal to a broad audience. War gamers and especially solitaire war gamers are very forgiving when it comes yeah. to, you know, gameplay stuff. But Undaunted, um, I mean, we didn't necessarily know it at the time that it was going to be as big as it is, right? I mean, that's it's it's been amazing. The reception's been amazing. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the fact of the matter is when you get into the broad board game world, many, most games are played once or twice and people move on. And so if you if you're designing for a a broader consumer base, right? A broader, you know, the, the general hobby war game market, you have to think about now, like, well, what happens in that first scenario? What, where's the, where do you draw the line between um, you want to sort of bring people in slowly, which was our goal with Undaunted, right? Each scenario for the first like three or four scenarios is, is very much building on the one prior to teach the game. Yeah. Um, and that was a deliberate choice. And I still think it was a good choice, generally speaking. But somewhere you have to draw the line between let's slowly introduce players to concepts and, and, and teach them the game as, we, as they play the scenarios versus, but what if this is the only time a player plays this game, right? right. We've been lucky. I mean, even, even with that, even with the first scenario of Undaunted being pretty basic, people still seem to love it, right? So yep. we've, been, we've been, I would say, lucky. Um, now we're, I try to be more intentional. Right with yeah. that, with, with with the first scenario designs, yeah, and and I and I I mean that exactly is like a lesson learned kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, and, and you know if you haven't played on Dalton Normandy, um, I mean you know as the game goes on, it does it really does get better, um, and you know when uh, when quarantine hit in uh, twenty twenty, you know March twenty twenty, I did do some solo gaming, and on Dalton Normandy was great solo. It was a very, I mean, you could just kind of like two hand it. Yeah. There was a, there was like a, a, an AI online that some guy just, just made that could just, yeah. Do that you sort know, of thing. It, it was amazing to see how well it was received by the solo community. Yeah. Um, again, again, we got, we talk about war gamers a lot. War gamers love their solo gaming. And so, yeah. and, but even the so the broader solo community was embracing it. And so you're right. A lot of people are playing it two handed. Um, Michael Kelly from One Stop Co op Shop yeah. came up with a, an, a good, um, AI system that basically was the sort of the widely adopted for people that did want to play it two handed. It was the widely adopted AI system until reinforcements came out with David Digby and David Turksey's solo yeah. system. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's it, I agree. I mean, deck builders are, are a pretty easy game to two hand, right? Yeah. Like you can kind of do it fairly easy. Um, and there was a bunch of different systems that people came up with for for how to resolve initiative because that's the that's the one sort of right. challenging issue. But but yeah, you know, it's it's been really well received and and I think you know, um, Undaunted Reinforcements won the Golden Geek for War Game for it did. War Game of the Year, and I think it largely did it. You know, hopefully it did it because of, of all the stuff that was in there. But I think the solo play was a big part of that for sure. Oh yeah, the system to to a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I have mine over there <laughs> and, uh, I, I do like it, you know, uh, I do, I, I do want to talk to it too, because, um, when this channel started, we did focus on some family games mm -hmm. and I'm one of the co co conductors on the channel. The other is Chris Barrows and he loves war chess and I played it for the first time this week. I see the similarities right away. You've said it yourself. It's from the same DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, but one thing I did hear you say is that you enjoyed this game thoroughly because you get to play it with your seven year old. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yep. That's right. So it's, yeah, it's, it's funny. He and I, I mean, it's actually sitting on the floor behind me because we just played it earlier today. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, he, you know, he, I play with all of my kids, but he yeah. loves it. I mean, loves the game. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if I had to pick a favorite game of mine, um, it would be this one, not because of any other reason other than the fact that it's the one I played the most with my kids. 
Um, and I, and I personally like it. I think it's, I think it is probably, um, it probably has the best ratio of like rules complexity to depth of play of yeah. any of the games. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic game. And I, and I think AEG did a great job with the production, right? So the production for the game, if it, if the pieces had been cheaper or whatever, you know, I don't know that it would have done as well. It'd been well received as it is. It looks so nice in person though. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I've just been doing it online, and I can't imagine. Like, I, I, I just only imagine it going up with actually playing with those tactile poker chips and just yep. going to town on you know different players. Yeah, yep. I know. I, I, yeah, I love it. I love everything about it, and I'm, I'm super proud of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you said, happy that I get to play with my kids. That's, that's like the best part of it. That's the best feeling. You yep. know, yep. <laughs> I'm yeah. looking forward to doing that soon. I have a I should say, so. I should say, you know, um, I play, I have a 13, 11, now my, my eight year old. And I should yeah. say that um, all of them are game, you know, they all play, they all play, but my 11 year old daughter, my eight year old son will play board games all day long, every day. Like I'm yeah. blessed, 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 blessed. The funny thing that they both dig my 11 year old and eight year old is by stealth and see. Oh really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they like they love playing at co-op with me. So that's funny. Yeah. yeah, it's like let's daddy, let's play that. They they never remember the name of it, but they just want to go and like pilot the ships and blow stuff up. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it is though. <laughs> that that game like that game is kind of like a board gamer's crapshoot. You yeah. know, you're just going yeah. in and just hoping for the best, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's you know. Yeah, uh, they, 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 the thing they, they, it's funny they struggle with because we were playing a custom campaign. So, you, you're like I said, your guys can advance or die or whatever. Yeah. And they definitely did not understand the um, push your luck element of, of letting people die. Right. They did not like it when their upgraded guys were killed. Oh, I get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that's uh, rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, one thing we should say about War Chest because I don't think a lot of people talk about this. You know, yeah. it, it, it is you know, family families can play it. Um, yeah. But there's also a, a four player version, right? So you can play right. it if you know if you from a family perspective. I think that's a nice little option for it. And I love it playing. I love my favorite game way to play games is team games yeah. by far. And so the fact that it has the the four player team option is is cool. I do want to I, I do want to bring this back to another game of yours. Um, you did mention earlier Switch and Signal. Mm -hmm. Switch and Signal for a while was my most anticipated game. Uh, one of the top of my gotta try for this year sure um because you know i like co-op games mm -hmm. uh i'm a sucker for train games okay uh, i got into the whole dark waters of 18xx oh okay, like, okay yeah yeah, yeah. I, got, I got deep i got in yeah. deep yeah. um this is not an 18xx game no 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 at no, no. all this is the other end of the spectrum <laughs> this is but i'm fine with that like i, I like pick up and deliver and yeah. this game um this game ha had that feeling of wild ride that I like and buy stealth and see. Okay. Yeah. People yeah. don't die really. You right, know? Right, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and so uh, this game kind when I, when I played this, uh, so by stealth, you know, switch and signal, I'll describe your game for you. Sure. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> in switch and signal, um, you are trying to, uh, deliver these cubes over to a city. In this case, it's Marseille, but then there's a different board. And uh, the way to win is to deliver all the cubes from the city to the city of Mar to the port of Marseille. But in order to do so, you are are setting the board up for these trains, and the trains are essentially moving in a roll and move fashion. Mm -hmm. So they just roll, they move, and you're kind of stuck in like the pipe dream sense of like changing the routes to make mm -hmm. everything go the right way. Because if you don't, you start losing time, which eventually will make you lose cards, which the cards are the timer for the game. And I love the the puzzle of this game so much. I've played it a lot solo because yeah. it just, it works so great. I mean, two-hand solo, it just works phenomenal. And yeah. I, I play with, and I've played it with two players. And I told them, like, listen, sometimes you just got to go with it and just got to, <laughs> you, you just got to deal with what you got, you yeah. know? Yeah, and yeah. so, uh, so tell us some some about about Switch and Signal about the design process for this one because yeah. this is a second ed edition of this. So no, or? so yeah, so yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, it goes back to one. It was one of the very first things I started working on, even before I moved to the UK. So I was in the US, and I distinctly I have a horrible memory, but I distinctly remember. You know, it was born. The origins of it are I introduced my mom and dad to Ticket to Ride. Okay. My mom and dad are not board gamers at all. 
I mean, like they, they play like Scrabble and Yahtzee, those kind of games. So they're not hobby gamers at all. I introduced them to Ticket to Ride, and they play Ticket to Ride so much that the board like broke in half. Oh my goodness! Overuse and the cards literally stink because of like the oils and stuff from them <laughs> handling it. I mean, like they play a lot of Ticket to Ride, yeah. and so um, but but my mom is not the most gracious loser. Okay, and so I was like, you know, and and, and they're huge model railroaders. Okay, huge model railroaders. And so I was like, you know what I should do is I should come up with a train game for my mom and dad that they could play together so that my mom wouldn't have to deal with losing, you know, a competitive game Yeah. Um, that evoked a little bit of that, like, uh, managing a model railroad, right? Like, so that was the design sort of goal or inspiration. Um, so I started working on this 2013 or so, and it kind of went in fits and starts. I mean, so what you see on BGG, there's another game called Switch and Signal with the ampersand spelled out as and. Yeah. It is the precursor to this, and I just made it available as a print and play while I was doing des- development. So it wasn't like okay. a first; it was never available. Um, but that's why there's two listings on BGG. And and if you know if you've ever interacted with a BGG database, if you were yeah. to go to BGG and say, "Hey, that was never actually a game. Do you mind just taking it off of BGG?" Which is what I would like now. They're like, "No, no, no," because people have linked to it on geek lists and stuff, so we can't possibly mm. remove it. So we're like, "Okay, whatever." So, um, so it will forever live as a game that doesn't exist, but, okay. but, um, yeah, it, so it, you know, this was the game that like I said, I worked on it, started 2013. It was published in 21, I think yeah. officially in Germany. I think that's right. And then this right. year in, in the U S um, it, it kind of lived this weird life. Like one, one publisher took it, was really interested in it, but they wanted to see if it could be competitive. So I did some rework on it, which I didn't like. And it, so it just, it just had this weird sort of, it was always sort of like on the back burner while I was working on other projects. And then finally, yeah. you know, just unbelievably lucky that Cosmos was interested. Um, and because Cosmos has done an amazing job and they're an awesome publisher. Um, and so I, the, the, the most difficult time I had with this game was when it was published in German, uh, it was like, it wasn't clear to me when it would come out in English. And I was like, oh, the irony. If this game ne- is never released in English, it's a game I literally, I just want one copy so I can give it to my parents. Yeah. That's all I want, right? Um, but so now it's available in, in French and Russian and whatever. But um, but yeah, I finally have an English copy I can give my parents. So it's like, you know, it only took me eight years to give them their present. But That's awesome. I, yeah, I was going to ask you, because I saw that in the rule book. It was dedicated yeah. to your parents. So I'm yeah. like, oh, that's fun. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, uh, it's funny when you say like roll and move because it is it is roll and move and what's funny like people are gonna like think that and they're like oh I, they're not interested in this game but I think it does it in a, like a sort of a clever way right because there's three different trains and they each move yeah. at different speeds and it's it is a custom die so it's it is technically roll and move but it's not like you roll a d6 and see what happens on every train on the board um, right but it's an interesting like I think the funny thing about that is that. It's still I, I would still submit it works really, really well in the game, but it harkens back to a time when you know you could argue I didn't know better. Like if somebody said design this game now, I might think I would say incorrectly that like, oh well, we can't possibly roll a dice to see how these trains move. We have to come up with some much more elaborate mechanism because people would never accept that, right? And so yeah. it's it's funny um because I think it I think it does work. It does exactly what you want. It provides that level of uncertainty, but still brackets the three different uh, train speeds. Right. And, you know, it. the thing is, you, you mentioned it, it is very much sort of a, like a, a common concept with co-op games is it gives that puzzle feel, but you but there's never, you never have the complete certainty about the trains, right? Yeah. So you can plan as much as you want, but. Exactly. There's really no control. And what's so funny is uh, when I've played this with, with some friends, I preface it that way. Mm-hmm. I'm like, listen, we could be as thorough and as planned as we can. If we don't get the dice we need or the cards we need at the right time, but that's just that's just how it is. Yep. And 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 you got to be okay with that. Yep. And and you know, I mean, to that that depends on what kind of gamer you are too. Because there's some gamers where they just look at that as a negative, like they sure. they they want the control, right? Because you know the the antithesis is what like Monopoly, just rolling right. around sure, and moving. Sure. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, you just roll two e twelve or two d six and see where you go. Right. Or a know. talisman or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And right. and we don't want that. You know. Right. Yep. Um. So you do have resist upcoming. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to talk about resist, uh, for sure. And then I'll I'll 
talk about some other stuff then yeah sure it should be good um so resist tell me about this upcoming game that uh i'm yeah. probably gonna back <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> so uh resist is and we should say like right off the bat because the publisher will, will kill me if i don't say this sure. uh so it's it's may 12th on game found is when okay. it will be will, is when it will be out that's when the game found it's less campaign. than a week from today yeah yep yeah. yeah. um so resist has a I keep saying this, a broken record. It has an interesting origin story. So uh, the publisher, in this case, Salt and Pepper, they are a mm -hmm. Spanish publisher. Historically, they've they've done, they've specialized in localization, Spanish language localizations, right? And so a lot of what they do are the um, button shy games, mm -hmm. right? But they've also done Watergate, which is and one of my you know absolute favorite games. Me too. Um, it's just a brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Game. I mean, we should we should have a discussion. Let's let's not forget to discuss cdg like car driven games right okay. before we um because that's sure. they're just amazing but um they so so the main guy there gonzalo he the, the the guy who's the main person at salt and pepper he is also independent of his publishing stuff he runs a review site and he's a big historical gamer and so he had played a couple of my games to include pablo's house and he reviews them on his site and so he was familiar with my um historical games my war games and he reached out to me and he said, "Hey, I would like you to design a game for for Salt and Pepper. Like, our we want you to 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 be we want you to design a game for us, not a not a localization, but like for them originally, yeah. so that they could do the English language as well as the Spanish language version." And um, this is just I'm I'm super blessed that like I think the next two or three years right now for me are planned out with games that are either commissioned or already signed or whatever, and so. Uh, and I have a day job, so and I have a family. So yeah. I'm, you know, there's only so much time in the day to work yeah, on game yeah. design. And so I kept telling, I was like, "Hey, look, I I want to work with you. Um, I love the vision you have for the games, but I just I just don't have the time." And I kept saying that, you know, for probably six months, I, I told him that, or a year, or whatever it was. And then finally, like all the stars aligned, and I happened to have about a two month window in my design work where I had some flexibility, and so. Um, I reached out to two people that I've worked with, uh, Trevor Benjamin, we talked about, co-designer for Undaunted and War Chest, et cetera. Um, and then another person, we haven't talked about uh, Sniper Elite yet, but but right. Roger Tankersley, who I worked with on, on the Sniper Elite. And I said, hey guys, you know, it's this this publisher, Salt and Pepper, they want me to design a game for them. Uh, they said you could design whatever you want. It could be any game, right? Like the, the, the sky's the limit. I wanted, because, they, because Gonzalo was a fan of historical games and because they're a Spanish publisher, I wanted it to be a theme that I thought paid like sort of respect or homage to those two elements, right? Sure. And so there are a couple of topics I thought about. Um, one is is La Nueve, which is a unit, Spanish unit that was integrated into a French unit in World War II. Um, they did some interesting things. They were there, part of the unit that, that liberated Paris. Uh, okay. But then the other one was the Spanish Maquis, right? So everybody knows about, if, if you know about the Maquis, you know of it for one of two things. Either you know about the French Maquis, which is the much more common during World War yeah. II French resistance. Or, you know, if you're a geek, you probably know of the Star Trek Maquis on Star Trek <laughs> 9, right? Those are the two Maquis. Yeah, true. Nobody yeah. knows about the Spanish Maquis. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, this would be a really cool theme. Like, you know, it's 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 historical. It's, you know, pays homage to the publisher. It's this underserved theme. I mean, certainly I don't think there's any other game on the Spanish Maquis. That's a pretty niche thing. That's my specialty yeah. is is Nick. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's how, you know, I was born of that. I emailed Roger and, and Trevor thinking maybe one of the two of them is interested and they both came back and said they were both were. So I was like, okay, well, I've never designed a game with three people before. Let's see how this works. And it worked really well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it was, I thought I had a window of a couple of months. It actually took a, a good bit longer. And part of that was, it was by far the most elaborate play test i've ever run we had okay. something like 70 play testers and they were all reporting back with tons of data because this game uh it doesn't have so how do i say this in most of the games i've worked on like undaunted right um you're going to roll at the end of the day no matter what you do you're going to roll a die to see if you're successful right uh switch and signal we already talked about the uncertainty right. there's always this sort of like thing this this uncertainty or luck factor that like a little bit helps play the playing field a little bit, right? But in resist, there's none of that. There's there is the sequencing of car how cards are revealed, and that's it. Everything else is you planning for what you're doing, and mm -hmm. so uh, 
the game really needed to be finely honed. And so we had a pretty extensive play test period for it. But, um, but probably the thing that's the most unusual about this is the artist for it, right? So the artist is yep. Albert Montes. And so uh, for people who are, if you're into the comic book world, you probably recognize him. He's, he's a hugely popular artist in Spain, uh, comic book artist in Spain and, and across the world. He's been nominated for the Eisner, which is the comic industry's mm -hmm. top, you know, award in the comic industry. And cl clearly, just from the art you've got up, it's it's absolutely gorgeous and it's it's unusual, right? Like it's not like every other war game art or whatever. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, as we were designing this, and we knew that Albert was going to be the artist, it <laughs> there was a sense of like, well, this game better not suck because if the game's <laughs> bad and the art's good. Then what's going to happen is people are going to buy it because the art and they're going to play the game and be like, this game's horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of there was a lot of like sort of special anxiety in, in in designing this one. But yeah, it's it's it is another specifically solitaire game. Um, I it's not even I would say this is not a war game. This is a historical themed get card game. You know, solitaire yeah. card game. Um, where you are managing a, a cell of Spanish Maquis and you're going up against Franco's forces. For people that do know, this is this is pretty you know niche history. But essentially, you have the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 39, which was a precursor to World War II. The 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 Spaniards that you know Franco took power. The Spaniards that fought against them had to were pushed out. Many of them joined the, the French Resistance, who they became the Spanish Maquis. Then after World War II ended, they were hoping what would happen is since they were fought alongside the French, that um, the Allies would support them in their battle against Franco to liberate it from, you know, uh, another fa you know, fascist regime, okay. which the Allies did not do. And so they were basically, the Spanish Maquis went back into Spain kind of on their own to try to liberate it from Franco, which unfortunately they were not successful. You know, thankfully Spain would would rid itself yeah. of Franco later. But this is the story of their sort of battle against all odds, trying to liberate Spain from, from Franco's forces. And is this kind of like a campaign-driven sort of thing? Scenario-based? Yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. So there's a couple of ways to play it. So again, you're, the heart of this game is you've got 12 Maquis in your cell of Maquis. That's the start of the game. There's 24 Maquis in the game. You're going to play with 12 of them. The first time you play it, we tell you just shuffle them up, play with 12. But after that, we, we suggest you draft them, which is to say you flip two over and you pick one to go on your team, right? And there's a reason for that because you'll learn all their powers and and the, you'll develop a strategy. And, okay, these combo, this is a very much a game of combos. Okay. So these guys combo together um, better. So you'll take them, you'll draft them. Um, you can even see the picture you've got there. Every character has two sides. They have a hidden side, which is thematically what's happening is they, they are operating as part of the Maquis cell hidden against Franco mm -hmm. versus the revealed side. The revealed side is... You've revealed that you're a, a resistance fighter. You've done this crazy cosmic thing. Uh, it's much more powerful. Well, if you choose to do the powerful thing, you lose the card for the rest of the game. And this uh, is a direct, for people that know card-driven games, CDGs, mm -hmm. when I say that, like like Watergate, like 13 days, like, you know, whatever. It's a very common thing in card-driven games where you play a card for what's called the event, right? It's the powerful thing you do. But if you usually win in a card-driven game and you do that, you lose the card. So that was the inspiration for this mechanism is... You play the card on its weaker side for the hidden side part, and it stays in your deck, or do you reveal it for the powerful thing and you lose it for the rest of the game? Right. Got it. So it's this constant balancing act about how you want to play each and every maquis, every hand. Um, but to answer your question, so you're in the base game, you're trying to score as many victory points as possible, which is accomplish as many missions as possible. Yeah. Um, but the game also will have a scenario book. So if you don't want to just play the typical scenario, the typical solitaire thing of get a better score effectively is what the base game is. If you don't want to do that, it's got eight standalone scenarios and then three scenarios that are like sort of the historical linked scenarios. Okay. Um, and so those scenarios are very much like do this very specific thing. And that's even more important for the draft because if it's, you know, defeat all of the counter guerrillas. If you know that's your goal, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to kill a lot of you know counter guerrillas, Franco's counter guerrillas. Then you're probably gonna want to bring a special group of Maquis to do that, and so you'll you'll want to draft them, right? And yeah. so the game has a. I would say the game has like sort of this out of the box. You shuffle out some Maquis. You're trying to score as many points as you want. Very basic, very straightforward. 
even though there's a lot of depth of, of comboing choices to this sort of like, once you've learned it, you're like, okay, now I understand the monkey. I know I understand how they combo. This is my goal. All right, let's, let's do it. All right. So yeah, kind of, it's kind of best of both worlds, I would say. No, it sounds great. Um, and just to highlight that, like the card driven games. Uh -huh. um, so resist is very much a card driven game. Um, and you know, you mentioned Watergate. What what mm -hmm. games? What what are some of your favorites in that in that? I guess mechanic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, th this concept of card driven games. Um, it's it's extremely popular in the war game world. Uh, yeah. Although ironically, when they first came on the scene, of course, war gamers being grognards that we are, said oh, they're no, those are not war games, right? Of course. Yeah. We've overcome that. I think that stigma's kind of gone. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so when I say card-driven games, I'm talking about, you know, you, like I said, you have cards, you maybe you have a shared deck, maybe you have your own, whatever, but you draw it, and it's usually got a thing called ops points, which are like these sort of generic points you can do things with right. or an event. And oftentimes, if you don't play the event, you, your opponent gets to play it. Like, that's a sort of overarching, oversimplification yeah. of a card-driven game. So yeah, my like Twilight personal, Struggle, right? So Twilight Struggle is the, is the I mean, everybody knows Twilight Struggle. Yeah. And it, yes, it is absolutely a card-driven game. I don't like any long games if a game's longer than two mm -hmm. hours i'm kind of tapping out right like yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my breaking point so what that means is when i when we're talking about card driven games i already mentioned watergate uh mm -hmm. 13 days the recently released red flag over paris which okay. is uh derived from fort sumter both of those are gmt games um those are games that uh, there's a game called 300 that came out recently any any card driven game that like if it has a small footprint and plays in like 30 ish minutes, maybe 45, because what you're going to get is the tensest 30 minutes. Because I'm all, all, all of these yeah. are two player games, right? These are all two player games, I should say. You're going to get a ridiculously tense 30 minutes, yeah. right? And and this the return on investment for that is so high that that that's that's my jam. Um, so yeah, for sure, when it comes to two player games, that's probably my preference. And then in the world of of multiplayer game, I already talked about like sort of my my love in life is the the hybrid war game euro kind of style games especially like area influence or area control that's so i was going to ask you about that because um i saw on your on your board game geek profile you have a a badge that says you're a waro <laughs> yeah right yeah war game euro war yeah. you know some people some people spell it w-a-r-o and some people spell it w-e-u-r-o doesn't yeah. matter if it's a, if it's a, and, and really, really, it, I wish it was some elegant way to say historical, historical, uh, Euro combination. Cause it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be war. I just give me some history with the game, but give me some Euro mechanisms. And I'll, I'm a happy boy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Cause <laughs> yeah. I, cause I know there's, there's always been for, you know, for a long time, there was a, a stigma between like war games, train games, Euro games, Ameritrash games. I feel mm -hmm. like those, it's breaking more so yeah, now sure. right yeah for sure um but in terms of like a war gamer what euro game would you recommend to a war gamer mm, yeah yeah so i think um there's a few different ways you can approach this so yeah. if if the like one way to do it is not try to get them like to go in on the deep end like if they're if they're like a uh, cube pushing Euro kind of person, right? Like mm -hmm. the first step might be a Blood Rage or a Kemet or something that's okay. not like a war, historical war theme game, yeah. but like a game that shares some of those um, like gameplay concepts, maybe, right? Or, or feelings you get with a, yeah. with a war game. So that might be a good first step. Um, but if you think the person would enjoy the historical side to it, I always recommend the Birth of America games from Academy which are okay. like 1775, 1812. My, my personal favorite is 1754. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the, oh, this is a weird way to say it, but I'm a big fan of the mm. French and Indian War from a historical topic perspective. Right. And I think that 1754 is the best in that series. So it is super rules light. It is, I already mentioned this, it's, it's a team game. So I love team games. Yeah. Um, so it's great with four players. Uh, so that's one way. That's sort of like the more... Um, dice rolly version of the like war game euro combination the yeah. other game that i would recommend people check out is um quartermaster general mm. other like euro war game hybrid that i mm -hmm. think you know uh euro players would dig because of the of the card driven element to it yeah i have to ask too um so i know i i've i've seen you 
tweet before about this sort of stuff because you're very you're pretty active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen you tweet uh, a lot at uh, not only about board games, but also about like uh, board game content providers. So I know you listen to a lot of podcasts about board games. What are some of your favorites, some that stand out that you just listen yeah. to all the time? Yeah, so uh, Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire is my BFF, mm -hmm. right? She, yeah. she's, she is doing amazing things. Like, um, I, now I, I will say, so let's, if you want to listen to podcasts about board games, right? Like, what's, what did you play last week? That's, she's not, that's not the show for you. Right. Um, her shows are oftentimes board game adjacent, but in my mind, they're really impactful. Like, they typically have like a strong, message to them or whatever and so she's she's doing special things i think i would say yeah. um a person that's doing similar work that i highly recommend is jason perez specifically on um one stop co-op shop so okay. one stop one stop co-op shop does a lot of different things my good friend michael kelly's on there he's awesome but yeah. jason has um some segments like shelf stories and good trouble and stuff and so jason's talking a lot about um Again, like the personal side, oftentimes of the board game industry. So I would yeah. highly recommend his work. When it, I already mentioned the Secret Cabal, Secret Cabal is like my, it's like my board game media guilty pleasure because yeah. it is the sort of like what did we play this week kind of stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I I literally grew up with them. You know, my board game life, I grew up with them. So they're they're kind of the the, the guys I know. Um, yeah. I'm good friends with a lot. I mean, like rolling dice and taking names. Those guys are great. Yeah. Um, who I'm gonna forget a lot of. I mean, there's just so many. Well, I'm, I, my go-to is uh, so very wrong about games. And oh, they well, mention so, you quite yeah, a lot. So, <laughs> so it's funny, you know, man, they are awesome, right? Yeah. Are, and I talk to, I don't, I don't really know um, Michael, Michael Walker. Right. But I do, Mark and I do email back and forth quite a bit. And he's so yeah. funny. And the funny thing about that is, you know, because he he's like, Mark's a little bit over the top jokey about me sometimes, right? But um, I, I took it at face value. I don't know. Well, I mean, I just mean like you know, his face, his, yeah, that was a very face handsome face. David Thompson. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, but what's funny about them is the very they they may have mentioned Armageddon. I don't remember, yeah. but I think the first game that they kind of semi reviewed or talked about in, in any level of depth at all was War Chest, which they don't like. Right, right. So that's the funny thing about you know Mark is always saying how much he loves me, and, and Michael's played some of my games too. But um, but they're not fans of War Chest, which is so funny. But, yeah. but man, they are good. Um, they, I'm trying to think of this as if I think this is true. I mean, they have a level of depth to their analysis of war games that many of this sort of typical like what did we play this week podcasts don't have. Yeah, uh, I would say, and so I really do. Yeah, I, that's where I found they, about by Stealth and Sea. Oh know. right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, I would say I, I remember tweeting this out one day, mentioning me being active on Twitter. I can't remember exactly who it was. It might have been it might have been Rolling Dice and Taking Names, Beyond Solitaire with with you know Liz Davidson. Uh, so very wrong about games. It was something like that. And like I listen to podcasts when I'm driving to work and when I'm jogging. Right? Yeah, That's all the time for both of those. That's all I do when I jog is listen to podcasts. That's all I do when I drive to work. And I remember getting into the car one day or running, and like all of those had new episodes drop, and I'm like. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. They're all amazing. You know, I love them all. So, uh, but yeah, so very wrong around about games is good for sure. Nice. Um, yeah. So I do have to ask um, you, you do have, you do design solitaire uh, board games. How long have you been playing board games solitaire? Was this a before COVID sort of thing? Yeah, it's that uh, man. That's it, you know what drove me to design solitaire war games is there was a BGG design contest for solitaire board games mm -hmm. uh, or solitaire war games, and I saw it and and I didn't really. Well, oh man, uh, uh, one one person I forgot to mention with the last question is Mark Johnson. So oh, Mark okay. Johnson is um, board games to go slash war games to go, and Mark is a fantastic dude. Love him, good friend of mine. Um, he so. I don't remember exactly, as I mentioned earlier, I have a horrible memory. I don't remember exactly the sequence of events, but somehow circa like 2015-ish maybe, um, there was a board game design contest for Solitaire War Game Design. And I was coming up with the original idea for Castle Itter, and I was listening to Mark Johnson's War Games to Go. Okay. And so all of those things sort of happened around the same time, which led me to to design Castle Litter, which was my first solitaire war game I designed, even though Pavlov's House was published first. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a weird situation where Castle Litter was sitting, it was signed first, sitting with a publisher that never published it. 
Pavlov's house got published. Then I got the rights back for Castle Litter. That's happened to me a lot. So, you know, there's a lot. Part of the, the reason that so many of these games have sat in limbo is they get signed with a publisher that never publishes it. Yeah. Right, get the rights back to you. And, 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 you know, that happened with Undaunted, actually. So it's, it's just funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I'm still to this day, I'm not really a huge solitaire. I, I love designing them. I don't play a ton. I don't play a ton of anything. Um, yeah. But, like, uh, what I will do is if my kids are interested, we'll play solitaire co-op. Right. Mm. So, like, my son and I have played a ton of Warp's Edge um oh yeah together, right we just play it together and so it's unusual for me what i will do is i'll get games uh solitaire games i'll put them out especially war games or historical games i'll put them out i'll push all the pieces around i'll read the design notes i'll look through all the components and i'll pack it away right like yeah. so I'm, and i get a lot out of that like i don't i'm not i don't have any problem with that i'm not you know complaining about it um so a lot of my enjoyment just comes kind of comes from like thinking about the design and thinking about the history and that kind of stuff um but as far as like playing playing solitaire games it's usually co-op with with my family when i'm actually doing it that's awesome Iron ironically yeah yeah hey you know that that's that's a great way to bring them into the hobby though too uh -huh. you know it's just it's a really solid thing yeah. um so uh are there any games that we didn't talk about that you would love to talk about or we, sh we should talk about um okay so really well, yeah, we should talk about two, that's, that's two upcoming, upcoming right? games we can talk about. Yeah, so Sniper right. Elite funded, I think, last year on Kickstarter. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's like literally in the U.S. warehouse. I think it just arrived. So people that backed it uh, know that it should be coming soon. Right. Uh, I, I'm speaking about the U.S. I can't. I don't remember the, all the different places all over the world. So, okay. but I think it's imminent, right? I think it's imminent. So, um. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about this, but also yeah. just, you know, I mentioned Roger, co-designer for Resist. He right. is he he is a co-worker of mine. We work for the same agency in the US, but we oh, both cool. moved to the UK at the same time. And so we we met each other in the UK as you as Americans working for the same agency. <laughs> <laughs> became board game buddies that's pretty wild so he, yeah. he was designing he, he was play testing a couple of things for me when we lived and we were just gaming together he would play test but one thing i i knew about roger is he loves hidden movement games like loves hidden movement mm -hmm. games and so um the publisher for sniper elite rebellion unplugged uh the main guy there duncan malloy he came from osprey so he was the guy who signed undaunted he did the devel original development work on undaunted so when he went to rebellion uh, Rebellion is a, for people who don't know, Rebellion is a big UK company that does, does a ton of stuff, mostly video games, but other media, comic books, all kind of stuff. So they were standing up a board game division. He reached out to me and um, he basically said, hey, what, how would you design a sniper game? And so I reached out to Roger and because my first inclination was, oh, a hidden movement game, that makes sense. And so... Roger, I knew he play tested some stuff. I knew he loved hidden movement. It was the obvious sort of partnership. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we worked on Sniper Elite. It was an interesting experience for me because I mentioned earlier that I I played a lot of like Gen 1 PlayStation tactical role-playing games. Well, mm -hmm. I haven't played video games since then, right? Every once in a while, I'll do something on Steam or whatever, but like I pretty much didn't play video games. Yeah. So when they asked me to play this, this was like, and I'm not joking when I say this, it was like... Um, it was like when I was going to work on Pavlov's house and I went and bought 30 books about Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. This was okay. Now I have to play every sniper elite game because I need to deconstruct <laughs> really? a video game. Right. Like yeah. I had to, like, I didn't, you know, it wasn't enough to just kind of like paste it on. Right. It really needed to be, how do you, you've got to go through, you got to play the video game. You got to talk to players like the, 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 alpha sniper elite players like the ones that are truly passionate like what is the what is sniper elite to you and you got to deconstruct that and then you got to build it back up and like make the build the, the board game around those those concepts and so um it was a very interesting design process to do, to do a board game adaptation of a video game and uh, again thankfully you know i partnered with roger on this and then the hidden movement part was is it's the core of the game so yeah, I should just yeah, I just wanted to make sure we sort of touched that on that. Um, yeah, sure. For people that are interested in in it, but um, this, this is that, the one I, I think I text I messaged you. This is the one that got away from me. Yeah, yeah, it's right through the cracks. And you know, yeah. it, the good news is, um, it was really like when obviously you know when it was on Kickstarter, 
Rebellion was talking to a lot of content creators. And so like the right. Dice Tower played it and, and it got a lot of really positive uh, responses. And so I'm hoping, what I'm hoping is that there's not that many hidden movement games, right? There's some, there's, you know, if you're looking for them, they're out there, but it's not like, a, it's not like deck builders or worker placement, right? Obviously. And so what I'm hopeful is that, you know, it's, it's warmly received and, and, you know, obviously like every game, but hopefully people dig it, you know? But this was, this, this also had solo too, right? It was it a does. hidden movement with it, solo. It, it does. This is a, this is a recurring yeah. thing with me. So yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I do not like designing solo systems for games that I originally worked on that, as multiplayer games, right? Okay. And so think about that. The, so there's two games that now fit into that category, that's Sniper Elite and Undaunted. Both of those actually were the solo system concepts were originally done by David Turksey. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if I'm going to design a solo game, I want it to be like, it is a solo game and I design yeah. it for solo. If it's, if it's tweaking a game I've already designed into a solo game, I just, I'm not good at it. I don't know how to do it. That's not my yeah. thing. Like you just, you know, part of life is just knowing what you don't, you're not good at. And no, so no. it's, yeah. it, it's funny that David, you know, uh, and, and he had help, but like David Digby did the vast majority of the development work on, on Undaunted, for example. Uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so it does have a solo system where you can, you can play against the defenders as the sniper solo. Yeah, that drew me while like hitting a movement with solo. I'm like, right? Oh. Yeah, I know. I know. Like, I don't know how you do that, but yeah, he did it. He did it. So he they did, did it. it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, hidden movements. I, I have a special place for in my heart too, because uh, Fury of Dracula was the first game that really brought me into. Yeah, that was yeah. my first hobby board game. Oh wow, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, so so the things that like the the games that definitely inspired it would be Fury of Dracula um letters white chapel yeah um uh specter ops specter ops yes yeah. specter ops yeah for sure yeah. big time yep yep nice. so and it's what's funny about every game has its own design challenges you know the, once we got through the core like the how the core game was going to work um that was yeah, that was of course the typical sort of challenge but man i'll tell you designing boards for hidden movement games it's like it's design it's like designing a board for any other game times a thousand in difficulty oh, and then yeah. and then we did there's four different boards in the game with it when you include the expansion and so it's like it was hard it was oh, man <laughs> it was difficult <laughs> was that was that like the toughest design you've had so far so i will okay so this is a fantastic segue because okay. there's one last game we should talk about and that's undaunted stalingrad right oh yeah so we have a slide for that. To go that's, to board yeah, that's, so by far, you know, when I look at, look at my life and I think about designing games and stuff like that, um, Undaunted Stalingrad, like I feel like I lost a year of my life designing this game. <laughs> it was the original, the original sort of concept from um, Osprey yeah. to, to me and Trevor. They came to us and they're like, hey, we want this to be legacy. And when right. they said legacy, what they meant at the time uh, was no kidding destructive legacy. So like oh, man. you would play the game once. Okay. Uh, so what that meant is, and, and it had to do, uh, I have to be, it's a little bit unclear exactly what I can and can't say. So I'm just going to say, okay. and, yeah. and Osprey will get mad at me later if I say too much. No worries. But, no um, worries. You know, like people are going to, your soldiers are going to die. And I don't mean that like, I don't mean like they die in Normandy where like, oh, you lose them this game and they come back the next, you know, no, no, no. Like if you, if a card's gone, it's gone. Oh, wow. And so, um, in the world and like the environment changes. So in, 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 um, Normandy or North Africa or whatever, when you're playing on the tiles, like you just use the tiles to recreate the map. Right. Well, that's yeah. not the way it is in Stalingrad. Like a tile represents an actual fixed thing that will never change over the course of the game, which is why there's 18 tiles in Normandy and like a hundred and something in Stalingrad. Like oh my it's God. ridiculous. And not only do they rec re represent like a fixed position, but they can be m like damaged, like buildings can be damaged. Yeah. And so like you're changing the environment around you and stuff. So that's wild. It, and, and it has this insanely complex branching narrative. Like the, every, every scenario, the outcome of every scenario changes what could happen after it. And so there's this exponential, you know, growth to the possible complexity of the scenario. So, or the campaign. So what that, that's all to say, we designed this game thinking that it was going to be a destructive legacy game. And then at the end, Osprey were like, they're like, you know what? No, 
this needs to be a replayable, whatever, whatever people want to call it. I've heard campaign. legacy campaign. Yeah. The point is it was designed as a legacy game, but now they've done the production in such a way that you can actually replay it. So from a, mm. from a gamer who's going to buy it perspective, it's like the best possible situation because they got all of the insanity that you would get from a, a legacy game, but they can actually replay it. So, yeah. so I say that this is the game that almost killed us, me and Trevor, because holy, and just in terms of like sheer amount of, of development work, design work, development work, play testing, and the mental, like when we would do something that would cause us to go back and look at the branching, like how the structure of the scenario campaign flow it would, I would just cringe because I was like, okay, I'm going to lose three hours of my life going through this flow chart of, of death and oh, you know, man. complexity, but I'm proud of it. I mean, it's, it, I love playing my games with my kids. I just, because I like spending time with my kids and it's, it's cool that they want to play my games, but I don't play my own games other than with them. I never really get to play them unless I'm demoing at a convention. So like my copy of undaunted North Africa has never been punched because I've mm. never played my own copy. Yeah. Um, and it's just the life, you know, I don't have time to play that much stuff. But this is the game of all the games that I've designed that I'm eager to play because I want to play a actual campaign of the yeah. game and experience it for myself. That's awesome. So, yeah. And this is this is scheduled to release for this year? I think or? I think well I mean I think, you know, that, I think or it's or whatever. the end of the year is what they're saying. End of year, okay. Yeah. 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 It'll it'll eventually <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, though, like I think it's scheduled for the end of the year, but printing's again, in the air print, and shipping yeah, exactly, is exactly. all over. Yeah, exactly. I know. Yep. Yeah. But that's awesome. Yeah. I, I. I mean, you know, I definitely want to. Yeah. Look, it's already in the wish list. Don't worry. It's already <laughs> yeah. there. It's already there. <laughs> it's on my, I need to put it on my wish list. Yeah. There you go. I, I, I'm. I'm always keeping tabs on on this thing. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I am looking forward to that for sure. Because you know, more undaunted the better. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I'm glad it didn't break you. It came close to breaking. <laughs> it came, you know. Close, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we came out of it. You know, maybe a little worse for wear, but we've do, we've we've smartened up. Um, no, that's awesome. So, yeah, we've learned we've learned a thing or two about how to design scenario based games. I think. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Well, this has been awesome. Just chatting with you about all these games. Yeah. Um, I do have one question. Sure. I, I did mention it earlier. I mean, I've been asked a bunch of questions. I, I've been, I, I, uh, I, I mentioned earlier. I checked out your micro badges, mm -hmm. and I believe you're one of 23 people that has a Cyclops fan yeah. badge. You're a big yeah. Cyclops fan. Yeah. No, it's funny. Like, I mean, as time has gone on, right here. <laughs> I'm not nearly as much of a Cyclops fan as I used to be. Oh, because 32. Of what, like, yeah. see, me and 32 other people, we know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know who the other person that loves Cyclops is? Um, um, Adam Sadler of the Sad Sadler. Oh, Brothers. really? Yeah, he's a huge Cyclops fan too. So we share that. We share that in common. But um, yeah. So here's the deal. I'm always the guy. Like growing up, my favorite characters are always like the straight laced, like leadery like cut and dry kind of like so my favorite ninja turtle was leonardo okay. you know like i'm always that kind of guy right so yeah. so i grew up in the era of like uh 80s nine early 90s i guess it would have been early to mid 90s maybe x-men and yeah. so at the time cyclops was like he was that he was like the the the, the leader that the consummate leader yeah. kind of guy I, I think that i don't follow comics really anymore but I think that like he's kind of gotten off the deep end with some of the character development stuff. So I'm not sure that yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of modern day Cyclops, whatever that is. But yeah, for sure, like old school X Men Cyclops was my was like my like the, like the cartoon, like the '90s. Yeah, the cartoon. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're supposed to be bringing that back. I think. I know. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. So yeah, so I'm a I'm a huge Cyclops fan, or was whatever, whatever. That's that right. Is. Yeah. Hey, it's it's that you know why not? <laughs> yeah. So this has been great. Um, I will, uh, I'll add a link to the resist, uh, game found campaign in, in this, I'll probably do some time coding after this video, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Uh, this has been a really fun, uh, interview. You yeah. Know? No, this has been awesome, man. I really appreciate you having me on. This is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, I just want to thank everyone, uh, for watching this in the future 
and we will see you later. Bye, guys.